I'm Francis Levy, Edgar Sessi and I are co-directors of the Philip Tatey Center. Uh, before we begin tonight's highly awaited program, I just wanted to call your attention to the exhibit on the walls, because people walk in here sometimes and they don't realize that our exhibits are tied to events. And this one is called Hive Web Mind, Animal Nests and Human Network. And this was kind of new human networks. It was curated by Hallie Cohen, standing over there, and Adam Ludwig. She's our curator. And basically, the idea is kind of an organic iteration of a round table, wonderful round table we did on social networking on May 1st, in which we had Sean Parker, who was one of the founders of Facebook. It was a very exciting round table. So you see kind of another manifestation in, in natural form of some of the ideas that we talked about cybernetically. Um, we will be concluding our current season with round tables on vegetarianism on June 5th and parallel universes on June 12th. And these are rather extraordinary events. The Vegetarianism Roundtable includes the well-known advocate of alternative medicine, Gary Null, Ben Sachs, professor of environmental studies at NYU, Andrew Smith, who has taught food studies at the New, at the New School University, and Ronald Stam, founder of the Center for Alternative Health and Healing, and finally, Niels Norn, who returns to Philip Tatey's after our uh, very well-attended Five Senses panel. He's the uh, vice president of the French Culinary Institute, actually. Now, Parallel Universes on the 12th features an equally impressive lineup. We have Krista Davis Acampora from uh, the philosophy department at NYU, and she's going to be dealing with Nietzsche's doctrine of eternal recurrence. Countervailingly, Eva Brand from St. John's College will address Poincaré's recurrence theorem. So we're sort of developing a whole idea about, it's called parallel, hist parallel universes, the history of an idea. So we're, we're looking at it from their varying points of view. Paul Park, who's a well-known science fiction writer who's dealt with this in, on, in that terrain, will be here from Williams College. And David Weinberg, the cosmologist and project scientist of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, will deal with the parallel universes from the point of view of astrophysics and cosmology. Finally, on that one, David Morgan from the New School will actually present parallel universes as an idea in the history of science curriculum. Um, our summer chamber film festival begins in July. You should go on our site, philiptades.org, and just check it out. Every, every summer we have films up here, and we deal with particular areas of interest, and usually there's three of them. So again, check our site and all Philoctetes activities. Our calendar is found at philiptades.org. We simulcast, so if you were to be at home and you went to philiptades.org, you would see this right now. And everything's archived. So you can see in about, what, Adam, three or four days, this particular round table will be up on, under past programming. It's also, we have a site on YouTube. And that site is, uh, uh, receives a lot of attention, hundreds of thousands of hits, actually, on YouTube. Which brings me to another point, which is please support Philip Tades. We need your support. We are really staying in existence, but we need every single penny goes to keeping, our, keeping us alive. So keep us in mind. I'm now very pleased to uh, introduce Michael Eigen, who's been here before. Uh, Michael Eigen is the author of 19 books, including Flames from the Unconscious, Ecstasy, Feeling Matters, The Sensitive Self, and The Psychotic Core. He's on the faculty of the National Psychological Association for Psychoanalysis and the and New York University's postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Michael Eigen will moderate this evening's panel and introduce our other distinguished guests. So. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't know. I, was, I thought you were going to do all the introducing. Yeah, yeah. You don't want me to do too much. But, uh, yes, but I'm gonna, I'll start it off and people. Or you can have, you know, Michael, if you, if you feel, if, you, if you'd like people to introduce themselves, they can. Go. I'm going to, uh, I'll just say a few words and then everyone can speak for themselves. You know, so that we have Pearl Abraham, who has written on, as far as I understand it, fundamentalism, the Hasidim, and uh, her latest book, The American Taliban. Uh, which she says is uh, Sufi, so I'm curious about what kinds of different kinds of because the Sufi I know the kind of I mean Rumi and uh, you know the Sufis that I know have spoken to me like to my heart to my been beautiful so I don't know the I don't know this other kind that she that she's writing about Richard Sloan who is, has done research on. Uh, um, the uh, connections between uh, different kinds of emotional states and heart disease. 
and has also, uh, I believe, uh, you have a book out, which uh, on uh, trying to, as I understand it, uh, give separate uh, religion from uh, neuroscientific research, in the sense of uh, to give each their due, that uh, the, the fusion or the, the the confusion between scientific research and uh, and uh, and religion as a, a pathway to health, uh, he has some uh, some some critical and evaluative remarks to make. And by the way, we have books for sale. Right. Where are these books for sale? Right over there. <laughs> After they'll be sold tonight. Oh, all the books will be. Free. They make lovely holiday gifts. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming you have books from all of us, and, and maybe audio. As many of them as we can get, they're there. Okay. Uh, Larry Shainberg, who's uh, of course famous for Bevelin Zen, and uh, I've heard good things about and Bevelin Zen for for over uh, a decade, and maybe, or two decades, and maybe uh, it's, I'll be inspired tonight to actually read it myself. But every, every, <laughs> I recommend it. He has, uh, everyone, everyone I talk to recommends it. Yeah. Uh, he has also a book on, uh, bra uh, the nonfiction book on a brain, uh, brain, brain surgeon, and uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, a, uh, a, a, a trilogy. Uh, or three novels uh, later, uh, done later, that uh, has gotten very uh, wacky reviews. Norman Mailer says uh, says it's just one of the craziest things he's ever read, and uh, it's gotten very positive and uh, scintillating. Uh, if you like, if you like uh, aspects of madness, and, and uh, it seems to be there. Uh, okay, Jeffrey. Uh, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Shugan uh, Abbott Adams Arnold Arnold, Arnold uh, is the abbot of the uh, uh, Brooklyn uh, Zen uh, Center. Uh, he was uh, uh, entered, as far as I could, if I ha if I remember, entered uh, Zen seriously uh, as a monk maybe 20 years ago. Is that correct? And uh, and uh, Sensei Luri was uh, uh, trans was your sor transmission source, and uh, I don't I didn't find a book by you, Jeffrey, but I found <laughs> audios audios. You have audios online, and I have at least one student who who who, who likes them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll start by saying uh, a few words that each of us has in them to say about the topic and see where the loose threads are or what alleyways open. Uh, as for me, I, I wrote a, a book on ecstasy many years ago, and I thought I was going to be writing about something very happy. And I was sort of surprised as the book evolved that the attention kept turning more and more to destructive ecstasies. And I don't know where we're going to go tonight, but the prominence of destructive ecstasies in human culture is, is, is stunning. You were going to say, Francis? No. You're you're hanging in there, Pearl. You want to start off, and we'll go around. We'll, we'll go go around. Say whatever is in your. Um, so I thought I'd start with a, a critique of the title of this evening's event, the politics of ecstasy, because as I understand it, um, the ecstatic experience has nothing to do with established systems of thought or with doctrinal dogmatism. Um, it's an individual's experience. It's anarchic, it threatens the establishment, uh, and because it's so individual, it doesn't really have, um, the word politics seems to be make it an oxymoron of sorts. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So Pearl started with a critique of the title. I'll start with a confession. I have no idea why I'm here. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know anything about ecstasy. I've experienced it on occasion, but. Uh, but so there, that's enough. So. That's it. But, you, but you've written about but you've written about cognition and religious experience. I've written about I've written about uh, putative connections between religious experience and health. Yeah. So, so that's why you. Okay. <laughs> if you didn't know. You're, you're, to, you're here to balance the ecstatics. That's right. Consider yourself balanced. <laughs> Well, I was confused by the uh, description of the panel completely. 
but it uh, led me to think a lot about the history of religion, the history of God, and uh, finally uh, uh, brought me to understand what I, uh, the problem of reification, that I think it's what I would like us to deal with, the way uh, uh, God, the visions of God that have been consistent through human history, and uh, the way completely without idea, without conceptualization, and then as it's become, has been reified, it's had disastrous results, as we all know. So that's the way I thought this panel, I would like to see this panel go, is to talk about first what we mean by religion in the first place. And, uh, I know you said that you had, your work was critical of a lot of the uh, neuroscience, uh, the science, the, the research has been brought to bear and that immediately we understood that the definition of religion is up for grabs. Nobody understands what they're talking about, really. Larry, when you say reified, you mean in the Marxian sense? No, I do not. I mean only in the conceptual sense. Uh, I mean becoming an idea. The, anyway. Um, <clears throat> This line in the description that says, uh, we'll examine the factors that draw people into fundamentalist religious sects. Um, uh, I think what might be interesting is to explore that, which in a sense is a movement towards certainty, a kind of absolute certainty, um, juxtaposed with what, Pearl, you were talking about, which is um, the other side. Is it the other side of the, uh, in a sense, a dissolution? of that kind of knowable certainty, which is the realm of mystical paths and traditions and practices and experience. And as a part of that, what is it that actually draws, because we see, draws human beings to these different paths, because we see so much um, yearning for a kind of certainty. Um, mm -hmm. We were talking about Karen Armstrong's book. She wrote a book on fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. um, and what is that in human beings and all of us that seek certainty? And what are the consequences of that? Is there any? <clears throat> and what happens when we find it, right? Whether it's true or not, is it possible even for it to be true? And what, what are the consequences of that? And what happens when we release that attempt to find that kind of knowable certainty? You know, is the only alternative confusion, or is confusion actually a kind of certainty? So that sort of, not even a boundary, but th those two paths, I think. Yeah, I think we can connect the two um, questions that are what you're posing um, and, and start maybe with that if we want to jump right in. Um, if you think about how religion is made. Let's talk about the three monotheisms and for, for starters. Um, I don't actually think of Buddhism as a religion, but you can tell me I'm wrong. Um, they don't begin with a system of law and with any certainties at all. They start, all, all of them started with a prophet, all three, with a prophet who has a vision, and it's a very individual one. And it has nothing to do with, um, thought, with any communal, um, system that follows laws or agrees, you know, to re restrict themselves or anything like that. Although um, they what they spoke of was they spoke of with great confidence. Right? Yes. Uh, In um, terms of if, what what their vision was and how they saw it. If, if you think of the vision that initially takes place as an imaginative one, one that takes place in the world of imagination and um, think of it as, um, the Sufis call it the world of Hurkalia, which is an Hurkalia, H-U-R-Q-A-L-Y-A, which is actually a, not, not the, it, it's, they call it an interworld. It's between the world of our, of our sensory experiences and the, and the intellectual world, which they also call the angelic world. Um, and this world is a place in which prophets, poets, anyone uh, involved in creative enterprise um, enters into to create. So it's, and it is a world in which you have to be comfortable with not knowing initially. Um, the goal of, um, of visionary experience, ecstatic experience, 
is finally to know and be known. Um, but to begin with, you have to be comfortable in the moment of not knowing. Think of facing a white page or a blank screen as you sit down to write. And it's only in the descent, it's called a descent, often Harold Bloom calls it a descent into the oldest and best self, uh, in which you suddenly know and are known. Um, and of course, it's been, it's been referred to as the vision of God. But, re but um, in, in non-dogmatic um, descriptions, it's considered the vision of the self, a self-knowledge, a gnosis, in mysticism's terms, that um, requires both comfort in not knowing and then a kind of comfort in the knowledge that is gained. So if you think of that as um, the beginning the, uh, the found, or I, I wouldn't even call it the foundation of religion. It's that vision that then is used to turn, to form a religion. Um, and that's and so this is I, I'm posing this as a beginning uh, and under, uh, to, a, a way to begin to talk about what exactly is religion. What are we referring to when we refer to God? There's I mean even the word God. I mean what actually what actually is it? It's an imaginative being. As, as it's reified. If you explain to me what you mean God, by reified. Uh, well, uh, the experience of God is, is as you said, it's, it's, a, it's a prophetic experience, an immediate experience. Or it's like Thoreau said, it, uh, the vision of God culminates in the present moment. Mm -hmm. So we really can't avoid, unfortunately, talking about the present moment tonight, which we all know, which our ordinary experience mm -hmm. And uh, the, every vision of God that I've ever read about every, uh, is always related to that, exactly what Thoreau said. Um, and in, in, in Zen practice, everything is resolved to the present moment. We are always uh, addressing that. But it is a religion in spite of itself. So uh, uh, I, I'm, one story that my... That well, went, what, what makes it a religion? Well, uh, this, uh, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. It's, it's in spite of itself. I don't know. It makes it a religion because it's uh, involved in spiritual uh, growth. It's involved, in, it's involved in direct experience of the present moment. Uh, but it is problematic, right? It, certainly, um, uh, it's problematic, its relationship to religion. Um, one story that came to me as I've been contemplating this panel was uh, with, with my own teacher who uh, was defiantly uh, against being called a priest or, or a calling himself even a Buddhist. He didn't, he, but he was a Zen master. And uh, he once told me that he, w he had students in Israel, he had students in London, students in Japan and here, and every day he would get up before his morning sitting practice and he would pray for all of them. And I said, uh, I was shocked at this. I said, how could you, you know, you know, what does it mean for a Zen master to pray? And he said, when I pray, I just pray. And uh, that's, at that point, uh, Zen is a religion, I think, I think it's fair to say. But, but you're introducing uh, but the the, con the the contradiction of the way it gets reified and the way it collides with religion, with the concept of religion. Uh, I uh, I told my brother a, a couple of weeks after this. My brother also knew him. My brother was a psychoanalyst, very literate, and had read a lot of Buddhist literature. And I told him this story about Roshi saying, "I just pray," and he said, "Well, that's silly." <laughs> And uh, I said, well, why, why, I said, no, you have to understand how he means just pray. I talked a little bit about the word just and how central that is to Zen and uh, how it's only the present moment. I tried to explain it. And he listened, heard me out, and he said, yeah, I see what you mean, but it's silly. <laughs> so I think that would be a, a pretty good summation for the argument we're bound to have tonight. I, I once read a Zen story about uh, a, uh, a, a, a monk who uh, 
apparently uh, saw a snake in the garden and killed it. And then was asked, you know, I thought you're, you're not supposed to kill living things. You, you know. And uh, he said, I, I saw the snake in the garden and killed it. <laughs> so he was, it's that kind of present kind of, kind of moment. But w w one thing that, um, to combine a little bit of uh, what, what Pearl and, and, and you said, uh, I've always been taken with uh, Moses uh, actually seeing God or on, the, on the mountain. That he had this moment of, wow, meeting God, meeting God face to face, though it gets kind of complicated because God sort of like shields him, shielded him from the meeting and only let him see his backside as he passed by. So, and then Moses comes down after having this momentous experience. I mean, how, you know, seeing God is, wow. And then he makes up all these laws, you know. I always think, I think of the Mel Brooks uh, movie where, you know, I got 15, com uh, then he throws the tablet breaks, uh, 10 commandments, 10 commandments. <laughs> well, of course, there were hundreds of them. And uh, they got more and more, the belief system kept mushrooming, like what Freud would describe as an obsessional, obsessive neurosis or psychosis. And, uh, and all religions I've ever studied end up having belief systems that mushrooms in one way or another. And they have evidence to support it, like reincarnation or you know, the soul of one generation passing into the other and so forth. So the reification thing that you're bringing up strikes me as, uh, it's not the word I would have used for it, but uh, it's, it strikes me as kind of central because you're taking something and then making it into a, an emotional belief system that you'll kill for. Yeah. And it's a long way down from seeing the, uh, the momentous vision and then becoming, uh, murdering everyone who doesn't ex dig your belief system. I think it goes back to what Pearl was saying earlier about what we might see as a distinction between religious practice or religiousness and religion, mm -hmm. you know, the institution. Um, and how, as you said, you know, the mystical experience is often um, suspect, held in suspicion mm -hmm. by the institution because it's fundamentally um, not anarchic, but it's it not be, yeah. about the preservation of the institution. And like any institution, there's a point in which its its mission becomes to preserve itself. Yes. Which it usually means that there are points where its interest is um, in opposition to the individual. Um, one of the things that's to me interesting about Buddhism is that although it has you know, institutions, it's fundamentally non-institutional in that sense, that it really lives in the individuals who mm -hmm. are practicing it. But <clears throat> I think what we've already gotten into is the difficulty of language. Um, so we talk about religion, you know, is Buddhism a religion? I mean, from my experience, it doesn't really matter. Um, if it's, from a Buddhist perspective, if that's skillful for you, if that's helpful to you to see it that way. Right. Um, who I and for whom I think most proponents of Buddhism as religion feel it to be, or if it's not skillful, as I feel like most people, proponents of Buddhism as a non-religion feel it to be, either way is okay, because fundamentally it's not about that, and that the it's not so much although there are poisonous ideas in and of themselves that in a sense what we've already started talking about is how ideas or beliefs or experiences that one might say are in and of themselves good, how does that lead to a kind of poisonous response or poisonous action? That it's not in the assuming that there's something good to begin with, that it comes from an adherence to, again, moving from something that's unknowable, uncertain, unfixed, you might say, to something that becomes a certitude, mm -hmm. right? Which then has, could, can be lost, can be challenged, needs to be defended, and so on. Um, and to connect with Larry's emphasis on uh, reification becomes confused with identity. That one's belief is who, who one are, is. Right. You know, I remember uh, <clears throat> we do a lot of work in the prisons. I'll make the story short. 
but uh, there was a fellow that I'd known for many years who was an inmate, and he got transferred upstate. He was just about to be released. He'd been in prison for a couple decades. His wife moved to Buffalo to be near him when he was released. She had just set up home and a studio for him to work and so on. Um, about a month before he was released, he was killed. Uh, no, he was not killed. He just died of an illness that was never really ascertained. She was a very, very devout Christian, very devout, and I knew her reasonably well. We had a lot of conversations, and she was very sort of more um, uh, conservative Christian, I would say, but very devout. And after Anthony, her husband, died, um, we had some interactions, and I remember talking to her a couple of months later, and I said, how are you doing? And I said, how is your faith helping you at this time? And she says, it's gone. And I said, why? And she said, because I was betrayed. And so and it was very illuminating for me. I've had a few similar experiences like that, where when that sense of faith is basically built based on a contract, yes. an unspoken deal, that then that, in a sense, is just setting up that moment of betrayal. Where, and that's where one of the Buddha's teachings was that any adherence to any idea, even if it's truth, becomes poisonous. And then we say, even gold dust, when it's thrown into your eyes, will blind you. Right. And so the Buddha himself actually said, do not adhere to any view, including a Buddhist view. Because the moment you do, medicine, it's the medicine becomes a kind of poison. Right. So that actually could take us back, do you want to jump in on this? <laughs> it could take us back to the question of prayer, which you mentioned, because I think just as we're trying to define religion, prayer is so open to interpretation. Um, certainly, I've read enough, uh, we all uh, you know, know that prayer isn't about asking for something, but most people do pray for something, if, you know, or make deals, like if you give me this, I'll do X, I'll be good. You know, and, but that's not actually what prayer was ever intended to be. Um, you know, poets think of their work, their poems, as prayer. So but that is more prayer in the form of praise. But how quickly did it become that? Is there any way to know? I bet like that? Prayer may have pre-existed the but, religion. But I mean that became it, like, what, what, what became that what? impulse yeah. to reach beyond. To reach what? To reach beyond yeah. towards some greater power, some greater wisdom, something that is not oneself for something that one needs. I would say that is um, probably, um, that, that form of prayer existed in superstition way before the religions, I mean, that's archaic. It, it finds its way into every yeah, tradition. Yeah, because we're humans and we tend toward right. that. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say it? that's yeah. the first noble truth? To, that is the human condition, that it does find it. So the human condition, you could say, is to reify. It finds its way into the poison finds its way into the purity. That is the first noble truth. To the desire that gives birth to the, that is the suffering, is a search, is a yearning for the for an object. And when when we to pray, just pray, is not praying for any object. There's nothing outside yourself. Uh, we we also, uh, Shugan could talk about it much better than me. But the Dogen. Uh, the Dogen Zenji, the great Zen master, said that faith itself is the practice. That's faith not in anything beyond the self, not in anything beyond the moment. But human beings also live in time. We have memory, we have foresight. And I believe that is, where, is the first noble truth and that reification comes out of that. The purity of the, the, po the prayer, just pray, we, gives birth to the prayer for the object. Even just the energy uh, insists on an object. Larry, isn't there some sort of, is there a payoff, though, not in terms of getting things, but in affects, affective states of mind that are produced yes. in praying? In yep. other words, the well-being that comes for that, 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 that neurotransmitters are, that are affected by prayer. Yes, but then, you, uh, then the, the, even if it's totally present, the desire for that to continue itself uh, can reify it. So it's an inescapable condition. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's like Kierkegaard said, everything resolves itself in contradiction. Right. Uh, and um, 
uh, I believe that is the first noble truth. That's where Buddhism begins. It doesn't end there. But uh, if, I don't think that it's escapable. In mysticism, there's something known as creative prayer, which is um, prayer that actually enlarges your mind. If you think of the imagination, it's really the only place in which humans are unrestricted by time and space. In your imagination, you can be everywhere and anywhere at any time. And so that enlarges you. That allows you to go places. I mean, just think of images, reading so. a book when you're a kid and where you end up. But um, creative prayer, which is, uh, is, might be something that expands the brain. I mean, this is how it's referred to in mysticism. So I'm looking at you because yeah, well, you might talk a little bit about the neuroplasticity of it, a kind of expansion because it allows for so much more. You know, many, so many more ways to think about um, where physically you might just be in one place, but if you can go so much farther and wider um, in, in your imagination, which is so powerful, it must expand. Uh, there's a kind of expansion that's talked about as part of that ecstatic experience. That's really the goal. And meditation, too, probably has some of that. Um, if you think of, I know the Kabbalistic meditations of the permutations of the letters. If you've ever done it, um, there is a kind of concentration and attention that it requires where your brain opens up um, and sort of has to stretch to accommodate all the permutations to be able to make it. I mean, just try for yourself. I did this as an exercise and tested all my brothers and sisters. I have a lot of them. And um, said, okay, can you recite the alphabet backwards without thinking about it? And, you know, for most people, it's not as easy as you would think. Um, I have one brother who could just do it like that, but then he admitted that he would practiced it. <laughs> um, so... Um, is there a way in which that can, you know, actually physically affect the brain? Um, Everything physically affects the brain. Since you're the surgeon, sort of. I'm not a surgeon. <laughs> uh, uh, the, brain, the brain man. Everything physically affects the brain. Yes. I mean, you know, so there's this discipline that has emerged in the past decade called neurotheology, in, in which, right, that's the appropriate response. <laughs> Actually, it's a little too mild. But what about uh, neuropsychoanalysis? I don't know what that is. Um, uh, neurotheology refers to using modern brain imaging techniques to study theological and religious experiences. And the, uh, so some of the publications in the field use certain kinds of imaging technology to, to study people before and after they engage in, in, in meditation or in ritualistic prayer. And the uh, authors of these publications report with astonishment that certain parts of the brain light up and other parts of the brain turn off. And, and, and of course you can, see, you can see the beautiful images, the, the multicolored images, which are spectacular. Uh, and and everybody asks, everybody says, oh, that's fantastic. And this, one of the authors of, of, of some of these studies has written popular books, uh, the most recent of which is called How God Changes Your Brain. Uh, and my response to, to that is, so what? Uh, he, he, he implies that by engaging in religious practices, certain parts of your brain uh, become active and other parts of your brain become inactive. There's a, so I want to write a, 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 a parallel book based on some other um, imaging data that show that uh, as London taxi cab drivers become experienced in their roots, their brains change. They become more experienced, they learn more, and there's very clear evidence that their brains change. So I, I, my book is going to be called How Driving a Taxi in London Changes Your Brain, but I don't think it'll get to... New York, it wouldn't apply. Well... <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the point is, there, there's... But Richard, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, um, so as I hear what you're saying, essentially everything that one experiences has right. a, 
of an effect on the brain. Yes, like have, engaging in this conversation or listening to this conversation is changing our brains. Okay, so is there? I mean, would you would there would you have a criticism then for an interest then in what in how we are. Uh, both how we are experiencing something as well as what we bring our experience to as a way to um, shape our experience of the world and therefore how we act in it. In other words, if I get up every morning and in a very concentrated and, and dedicated way bring forth hateful thoughts you know, that are grounded in my own reality, um, justified hatred, yeah. Um, and do that for a, you know, a specific period of time versus if I get up and try and cultivate thoughts of generosity and openness and you know, compassion. Um, you know, it's a simplistic no, no, it's a good example. example, but are you, would you have a contention against someone using that fact that everything has an effect on the brain and therefore I would assume the activities of it and then how we then carry that forth into what we do as a way of attending to how we are in the world. I, I, don't, think, I don't think the reference to, the, to activities of the brain adds anything at all to that consideration. You mean you, the activities of the brain have nothing to do with how we think or speak or act? No, 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 activi no activities of the brain have everything to do with how we think or speak or act, but I don't think Framing it as as a as a neurological consideration, as any you, you pose the the, the mm. question: Should you th mm. awaken mm. with hateful thoughts or thoughts mm. of generosity? Mm. And and I think it's self-evident to, to most of us in this room what the answer to that question is. So you and, and 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 we don't need to know that certain parts of the brain light up when you have one kind of thought and others light up when you have another kind of thought. It's just fundamentally irrelevant. So what they, what they try to do is to, is to, is to I suppose, to reify the, the, uh, the experience on the basis of its existence or its, its, its counterpart in brain activity. And that's just nonsense. You, but you're, so what you're basically saying, it's self-evident. Why bother yes. taking this up? Yeah. Okay. It's just, it just makes a headline. Yes, I mean, it's even a great today, headline. even yeah. today, there was a, a piece on the fact that creative um, enterprise um, uh, is very similar to what happens in the brain during any creative activity. is very similar to what happens to schizophrenics in, in, in their brain. What difference does I mean? How is, right. so, how is so, that informing us? Right. So there's so th there is a uh, there's some studies of. Uh, the the uh, neural correlates of the experience of transcendence. Uh, am I confusing this? There are. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the neural correlates of the experience of transcendence, and 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 it turns out that those neural correlates are, to the best that we can tell, identical to the neural neural correlates associated with panic disorder. So, you pick your poison. What what different? <laughs> This is a wonderful story of, uh, I, about Ram Das when he was uh, doing his first, early in the days when he discovered his acid experience and uh, went to India and had a, 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 guru, a relationship with a guru there. He took acid for him. To, uh, and, uh, he took acid for the guru? Yes, and the guru took it and it had no effect on him at all. And, uh, but he said that he understood Ram Dass, uh, uh, his passion for it. He said that, that um, America being a materialistic society, it was the natural that they would find God in material form. <laughs> so you're doing the same thing. I mean, you're, this is exactly the same yes. kind of materializing reification that uh, we're talking about in terms of the neuroscience, particularly in a culture like ours that is uh, literally drowning in reification. It's coming at us from all directions by media. Media is nothing but reification, uh, right? So uh, just uh, to, to make, to drive home that point in this field, the, the, the f one of the first books by this uh, University of Pennsylvania radiologist who's written about uh, neurotheology was called Why God Won't Go Away. And the first I chat that book. Yeah. yeah. Is that new uh, work? Yes, it's new I read that. Uh, uh, and, and the first chapter, the, the title of the first chapter of that book is A Photograph of God. Now there's, 
there's a question mark afterward, but it's a rhetorical question mark. He really <laughs> thinks that this is a photograph of God. It's a brain image. I, I, I heard on the radio just the other day the sounds that the uh, background noise of the universe makes. Uh, and they had amplified it and had a discussion of its musicality and amusicality. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, years ago I read uh, a, uh, a supposedly neuro, uh, neurological book on the God Center and uh, apparently there was a close link between the experience of God and where they located sites for aggression and sex. So that sex, aggression, and God. Well, so you read the Bible. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and in the Bible, God, God's, one of God's reflex responses to stuff he doesn't like that disturbs him is rage. So that, uh, and, and rage, I wouldn't call it exactly ecstatic. But rage is certainly one of the closest things to, for the people who are ragers to, I wouldn't say an orgasmic experience exactly, but where they experience themselves in a totality that few other emotions generate. And when you picture God, you know, when you picture God, you know, someone does something that pisses them off or the, the children of the earth just don't seem to uh, get it right. So let's blot out the whole, whole earth, make a flood, like a flood. And Freud called the primal trauma flooding, kind of emotional flooding. And it's like, you know, so if you read the Bible in terms of uh, a depiction of dramas of emotionality, dramas of emotional movement, and especially uncontainability, uh, as well as looking at it from a lot of reification or looking at it from, uh, uh, you know, my way versus your way, but also, Get, try, try to see it in terms of keep your eye on the emotion and see what transformations it undergoes. You know, thinking of uh, your mention of anger um, as a, I forget exactly how you said it, but for the rager as a kind of moment of supreme, what did you say? Totality. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, my sense of, of anger is really, it's a, it's a moment of, of grasping at control. You know, what is so often underneath the anger, the real thing that's happening is fear. Yeah. You know, why do we reach towards certainty? You know, this is one of the things mm -hmm. Karen brings up in her. There's always a reaction mm -hmm. to a feeling of, of loss of control, you know, in society and culture and ethos, whatever's happening. And that there's this sort of mythical reaching back to a more a pure, more fundamental time, but it's actually creating something anew that has never experienced, happened before. But, you know, fear is a very difficult emotion to countenance. You know, where I grew up <laughs> in Georgia, you know, for a boy to be afraid was an unacceptable event. Yeah. Anger, on the other hand, was very acceptable. And it's interesting how fear, you know, it's destabilizing, it feels like there's a loss of control, an uncertainty vulnerability, uh, whereas anger is a, is a wonderful kind of a perfect antidote to that because suddenly there's certainty, there's, there's control, there's power, there's strength. Um, and so, you know, thinking of it as, a, uh, I mean, a person can certainly be in a blind rage and there's a total, to, a total kind of loss, you know, being lost loss in control. that rage. A controlling loss of control is what... But it really, I mean, in my experience, it really is about control. You know, it's a desperate grasp. Something that we're touching on human, uh, basic human uh, pro dilemmas with what do we do with our feelings? Because we meet in psychotherapy, we, a lot of people who control with their fear, too. Where fear becomes also a vehicle of control. Control with their fear? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Don't, don't, don't be angry at me or don't, be, don't express... Don't express yourself fully to me. I can't take it. I'm, I'm, I'm too terrified, you know. And if you give, if you if you uh, assert yourself, I mean, you can't take self-assertion of the other, or can't take the difference of the other, and fear becomes an intimidating tactic too. I, mean, I think what possibly we're touching on a little bit is a nexus, a nexus of, of a nexus of uh, say emotional states that are linked somehow. There yeah, are networks of emotions that go together, like fear, control, rage, 
I wouldn't assign a primacy necessarily to any one of them because you can have any one of them as a defense against the other at different times. But you have this pool, this pool of all these different states, and they're interlocked in some way, and I don't, we don't really know what to do with them. Well, can I, I want to insert here um, the, the use of the Bible um, uh, for, to look at, to trace some of these emotions, gods and, and, and some of the earthlings. Um, I took a class many years ago at, at NYU with Aaron Applefeld, who was visiting, um, and uh, I actually had to, I extended my stay there, just uh, my time there, just because I wanted to take this class. He taught the novel, the, the Bible, only and only the chapters that have to do with the human human emotions, none of the metaphysics. That was he. That wasn't part of the original writing of the Bible, as far as he's concerned. And we looked at all those stories as a novel. And the idea was to trace because those emotions, are, those the, the fear, the anger, are what tell us most about ourselves. Um, and we were advised to follow those emotions through and see that they actually affect the end of the book, characters that would not have existed in the original story, in the first stories, and where it goes, um, as a way to understand the self, to imagine, to really imagine those emotions. So there is some wisdom in that. Yeah. Um, it was an amazing course, it was an amazing thing there's to do. Yeah, there's a, there's a big wisdom in, in the Bible as a, as a projector, as a teacher of what's inside us. Yeah. Because we, we created that. And even as a, you know, as a uh, way to, sort of like watching a Greek play, the catharsis involved. Yeah, right. Um, I was just thinking too, before of, uh, when, when prayer, when, when, when prayer as prayer, just pray to, when you, but that reminds me, someone told me the other day, a part of uh, the, Zen, the Zen book, the, the ambivalence, when, a remark she liked was when you talk to your uh, teacher about uh, being confused, and he says, well then, be confused. You know? Well, no, his teacher uh, said when you're confused, do confuse, do. don't be confused by confusion. Yeah. <laughs> And Just allow I, I, yourself to be confused. Yeah. Well, well, I, I, I wonder, uh, well, I mean, and I, that would be a very good place to look at reification, too. Uh, but uh, I wonder if we couldn't go further uh, with, the, with the question of anger and talk about the difference between feeling the anger and acting it out. There is a, uh, and, um, when, when um, uh, I once went with my teacher to uh, Greenhaven Prison. They were, when they were first trying to get a, a Zen group there. It's the group that <coughs> Shugan is involved with now. We we did not do it, but he, we met with the chaplain there when we first went in, and he uh, he said, "Why are these people in here?" And he had an it was an ashtray on the table, and he said, "You see this ashtray?" He says. Everybody wants to hit somebody, to throw it in somebody's face at the one chaplain point in their life. The chaplain said, what they, want to, they might feel like they want to, but these guys have done it. And that's where I think we can talk about reification. Because the difference between feeling the anger, doing anger instead of doing confused, just pray, all of those things are religious practices if you want to see them up. They're spiritual practices, but acting the anger out is, is something else. And I think there's, a, there's, I mean, language is a slippery thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's a, a important here to clarify what, what you're talking about. It, um, because it can be very easily misunderstood, you know, that to just be angry, for instance, is being so utterly aware within the anger that you're not governed by it. When we're, when we're uh, caught in anger, there's usually some sense of anger, but there's no awareness mm -hmm. of it, no clear awareness. That's why we're caught. Because the awareness requires a kind of detachment from the anger. Detachment, yes, but detachment itself is tricky because detachment implies a kind of distance, an aloofness, you know, a remoteness, being cold to the anger. It's not that at all. Mm -hmm. It's actually just the opposite. It's so intimate that there's nothing in, in the way. There's right. no fear of it. There's no reservation. There's no hesitation. But there's, and there's not control, but there's being in charge. Mm -hmm. 
there's an old story of a, um, a, a teacher who went into the latrine one night very late <clears throat> to use the toilet, and in the dark he bumped into a into a monk, and he and he calls out thief thief, and he grabs the monk and shakes him and says got him got him, and the monk says master it's not me it's not me. And the monks and the master says, it is. You just won't own up to it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that it's a complete taking of responsibility. Right? So it's very easy to, to hear this language, which has a very particular, um, not just meaning, but experiential uh, significance that isn't just you know, go out there and be angry. You know, go out there and be confused. It's talking about a particular state of awareness and consciousness that is that is being manifested within that what is normally a kind of d diluted state in which there is no longer, um, uh, I mean, it's not that, I mean, in a sense, nothing has changed except one's ability to yeah. see it, and that changes everything. I understand um, the, what you're talking about. It's similar to being, appreciating uncertainty and allowing yourself to be uncertain. Um, I think it was F. Scott Fitzgerald who wrote in an essay um, that the mark of a truly intelligent man is the ability to, to both know and not know at once, to be uncertain about what he does know. Something like that, to be able to look in, in more than one direction. Be, yeah. A kind of Janus figure. Well, well Keats, uh, Keats. Negative in, capability. In, yeah. The, yeah. The, the man, something about you know being as big as being able, as as being able to live in the uh, uncertainties without reaching after, without irritably reaching after facts and reason. To be, live in ambiguity without irritably reaching Negative after capability. facts and reason. Yeah. But I do think we could go a little farther with the question of anger and acting it out and becoming your anger, becoming confused, doing confused what this teacher meant. Uh, the, in Tibetan Buddhism, I, they, will, they say that if you, you become your anger, it becomes compassion. We're not talking about, like Shugen said, just, just feeling the anger and letting it happen. Letting it, we're talking about a total becoming of that anger. In which case, there's no, there's, if you are just anger or just confusion or just prayer, there is no self there to feel the anger. There's no separation from it. This is the vision of, of Zen, certainly. It's a vision, I would say, of God that uh, if you, that Karen Armstrong talks about, the always, it's in, always in, at its outset about breaking through the self become your anger if you are totally this anger you've become there is no self so your god can be your anger can be your god it is compassion mm -hmm. there is no self left to feel it and this is the i i would uh, submit the the gamble of all the religious practice but the irony is on the countervailing sides of that i mean you could have huge collective you, you, the, the, the giving over of self can lead to these collective expressions. Giving over the self, yes, but in, in the and case You're of, talking about consciousness. In no, but in, in the case of becoming the anger, becoming the confusion, there's no self to give over. You know, then it's already reified. I agree with you, that is, that's what happens. But once, in, in this vision anyway, if we could, this inherent spiritual vision, uh, there is no self left to give over. I'd like to add, uh, you, are we, are you going to say something? Well, no, because I mean, I think the, the, it's very interesting what you're getting at because it, it, it's kind of, it has, an, it, it has a built-in paradox to it. Because in certain cases, like in sadomasochism, there's, a, there's an attempt to be, people give their self over to, 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 the, to the, the dominatrix or the dominator. To get in, in, in certain forms of religious activities, it is the suppression of the self and the joining into the collectivity that leads into yeah. the basic, the, almost the, the little bit of the impulse of the, what this panel is about in the beginning, politics, being the collectivity, that's what that meant. Well, we know, uh, I'm sure Shugen knows the most, uh, experienced it a lot, of the way uh, Zen centers can collect people who are just practicing self-effacement. 
or masoch it's a masochistic, it can be a masochistic practice, but that's just another form, another version of the first noble truth. Another is that, is the role of the, of the, the leader then to sort of push them away to the, from the idolatry, to, from the, from the, to, to you, your, that, that, you, that you confer responsibility onto the other person. Yeah, well, there's a lot to this. I mean, it goes back to, I think, what Pearl was getting at in the, your very opening line about, I mean, what Larry is talking about from a Buddhist perspective, in a sense, is a very advanced practice. And when it becomes um, objectified, um, uh, it becomes a weapon. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, you know, it became, was employed in Japan during World War II, where Zen priests were, yeah. you know, employed to, you know, rally the soldiers to, um, you know, in just this kind of language, you know, that when you swing the sword, there's no one who swings and there's no one whose head that drops. That's bullshit or, or Buddhism. Yeah. All soldiers That's, are required to sort of... It's Enter not, into a but it's not, but it, it's a, it's a s extreme perversion yeah. and distortion. It's not, it's not even remotely Buddhism. Um, that, that's why I say it's advanced because it can very easily be used to justify, justify anything you want to do. This is, you know, the, and it's not that has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's not, it's not transforming the self into something. It's not transferring it to something, and it's not exchanging it for something more or less. It's not buying into someone else's version. It's a political use of ideas. It's like real. This. It's a direct yeah. experience that there fundamentally is no substantial right. self. I'd like to make. I want to. Exclamation point! Something because this keeps coming up. Speaking of poisoning, ideas that we are some kind of our control or what, all these different uh, ways of uh, ways of uh, I don't know what causing damage. Uh, it's like we have all these mechanisms inside to somehow uh, uh, deal with emotional states that we can't deal with by by causing damage. And it keeps coming up in one transformation or another. Uh, how damaging our attempts to work with the pressure of, uh, of feelings uh, is. Uh, that's one thing I, uh, uh, is in my mind. I, I, another thing is being a psychoanalyst. I'm very keen on the uh, on, on psychical reality. Psychical reality. It's maybe links with politics or maybe with consciousness or maybe with uh, uh, you know, what, whatever states. But psychical reality, here's an example. Uh, Winnicott has a patient and uh, it fits in a little with what was said about doing your, being with your aggression rather than uh, enacting it. Winnicott has an example and he feels, uh, has a patient with whom he feels Every session, there's an unscreamed scream. Every session is a silent scream. A scream that's never felt and a scream that's never, uh, a scream that no one knows what to do with. And the patient comes, uh, and the patient comes in one day uh, with an image of screaming in her dream. And it's like, uh, the scream became real through her dream, not by an enactment. That the emotional reality of the scream was being brought home because dreams were, in my, in, my, in, 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 my, in my view, that dreams are partly involved with trying to digest undigestible emotional reality, <laughs> catastrophic emotional reality in part. We undergo these emotional catastrophes and dreams keep flashing them in front of us, keep on flashing. SOS, SOS, something bad is happening, something bad, even a, a nightmare. So here this woman comes in and the scream has appeared in, in a reality, in a psychical reality, and she associates the scream with the, the last scream, this is of course poetic, imaginative, she associates the scream with the last scream she made before all hope was abandoned. That's the state. I should look at the Bible as states, look at the dream as states, and the person's experience of it as states. And 
So she gets the sense that here is the last, and now I am in touch with what I last felt before I lost all hope. So something is like, like pressing on her now is emerging. I'll make the long story short. After more what we call working through, working with the dream image, working with the dream feeling, uh, a couple of years later, she, be, she became a singer. <laughs> <laughs> She found her voice, uh, but here, here's, so it's not, it's just not a matter of control, it's just not a matter of reification, it's a matter of deep psychical reality, deep contact with what? Deep contact with what? Is it a self? I wouldn't, that's a self, no self, it's oscillating, self, now, now self, now, no self, God, no God, God, no God, we're oscillators, it goes back and forth, it goes back and forth, but the, uh, it, uh, it, this emotion, that emotion, now anger, now, now fear, now joy. It's like a, a, a cycle that one goes through. And uh, so I'm, I'm putting a word in for psychoanalytic contact with the depths. Another kind of contact with the depths that uh, I think uh, has links with other disciplines. Could I um, insert a uh, mystic way of look and philosophical way of looking at it? I just want to say one word and it's yeah. all yours. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the book I wrote called The Psychoanalytic Mystic, I begin it pretty much by saying psychoanalysis is a form of prayer. And the kind of prayer I meant links with what was said before about prayer. And an image I saw in the last couple of years of it, I want to just throw out and share it. Not everyone feels this way, I know. But in the movie Into Deep Silence, Into Great Silence, where there was a sort of a documentary of a, a monastery in Switzerland, the way the men prayed in the morning, they're on their knees in the silent state, the silent, and stayed with it, and stayed with it. Of course, you know, there's a Catholic belief system and all that, but I'm, I don't mean that. I don't mean that reification part. I mean the thing itself, the, the state itself, the, I, I felt freed looking at them. Like, oh my God, there's a taboo against feeling that. There's a taboo against entering states like that. And uh, there was a therapeutic movement. Is it, was it the solitude? The solitude. Um, the contact. Which... The contact with X. Well, it's a chartreuse monastery, uh, and, and there is a the monk. There is a monk in there. The only one, I believe, that w that they could get to speak in that documentary, who said, "God, we are here to, to worship God, but God is nothing but the present moment." Mm -hmm. So that's that's exactly what you're. And the present about. moment is wow. It's not like just the present moment. <laughs> it's, it is the present moment. Well, there is a wonderful bumper sticker called, uh, that says, I want the present moment back. <laughs> <laughs> back, back, back. Back in jail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you were in a safe pro. Um, the idea that um, there is no stasis, you're talking about states. Um, you can't just stay in anger, I mean you can, but the, um, the idea that you want to allow yourself to always become and not remain at being. So there's anger and you can stay there with the anger, but if you allow the anger to, it's not, I don't know if it's the anger becoming or you becoming with the anger, then there is that kind of movement you're talking about, yes. the change. Um, the growth, um, and I think that some of what we're talking about is that, that awareness. Right. So it changes, but, but you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to define, you wouldn't know, know the change, it would be such an internal thing, an awareness that changes you from an inside. So the anger actually can help you. And I wanted to point out that in the attributes of God, um, in, the, in the system of Kabbalah and the way they image it, well, anger is one of the attributes. I mean, we think of it as negative, um, but actually, it can be useful. It can. It, there is no negative, positive. No. It can be. It can be both. That's a question. Where do we get this capacity to stay with something? Uh, Larry brings it up. You bring it up in a book uh, I, I wrote called Rage. I, I talked about just, the book was just staying with rage, staying with it, staying with it. The networks 
of reverie and association, and something happens to it, and something happens to you. With the but this is true with any state that we stay with and stay with and stay. It's what Buddha did with suffering. Buddha did. Like, Buddha did. Why? You know, he was challenged. He, by, he, he suffering, and he sat with suffering. He sat with suffering. And my picture, one of my pictures of it is he sat with it, sat with it, was sat with it. And then the psyche undergoes a, uh, and a, and a, and a the psyche under, a wormhole happens. The psyche undergoes a, uh, a rupture of some kind or an explosion and one finds oneself in another reality. You stay with something so intensely, intensely, intensely and another, other realities begin to open up. There's an early sutra and which the Buddha talks about before his enlightenment that he's in the woods and uh, you know it's wild and he hears sounds in the brush and the trees at night and he's afraid so he investigates this fear and he's on his own and in a sense uh, winging it and so he decides that when the fear arises whatever posture he's in and he taught that there are four postures of spiritual practice, sitting, standing, lying down, and walking, <clears throat> that whatever posture he's in, which basically means all of one's life, that he will maintain that posture and not move away from it until he sees into that fear. So if he's walking and the fear arises, he won't shift. And I think what he's talking about is not just the, the action of walking, but that he won't turn his gaze away from that fear. Because, of course, as we've been talking about, that's the most difficult thing, because fear is frightening. You know, we don't like to be afraid. Where do we get the capacity to stay with something, like to, not to turn one's gaze away? From his suffering. Well, I mean, that's, we, we, that's why we speak of practice. It's something that's cultivated in meditation. But <clears throat> that it's not... these things unless something that it, something that happened to you? Why would anyone do this unless something happened to them that they had to contend with? But why, is, why has any person ever looked beyond That's it. their own small experience? That's it. That's we it. seem to have something, some sense within us. You know, it, you look at in all these different religions, there's always some sense of estrangement, alienation being expelled from the garden, being having fallen in some way from something, right? In Buddhism, it's, you know, it's, it's losing the sense of one's real nature. Uh, so there seems to be this deep kernel, this deep impulse within us that has a sense that there is something beyond just our own limited experience of things. And so there's the desire to return, the desire to come back. Um, what the Buddha realized is that it was never lost, it's not an it, that what we seek is always within but us, but it's sense. not something that can be seen with the senses, because the senses are conditioned, they're heavily influenced by, in Buddhism's language, karma. And so when we look, we see something, but we don't actually see that object, we see our mind viewing that object based on our history and our experiences and our attachments and so on. So that's why the meditation is used is to basically both free those senses of all that, those attachments, but also then ultimately to leap beyond, which is the real intimacy. So going back to even not knowing, you know, to talk about not knowing <coughs> is knowing. Right. But to be crass about this, say I was a person, a damaged individual, and I'm going to be very primitive about this. Uh, and uh, a I, met you. I, I met you, I, I, hypothetically I met you, I'd be lucky, but say I, on the other hand, met some Jim Jones, and he said, listen, you know, you, you, you were, it's, like, it's like children who would have very fractious houses, yeah. you know, they, they always dream of living in a place of peace, you know? yeah. so, uh, I, so, I, so I come home, you know, and I go, I, instead, I go to you, but if, if I meet, if I'm a car, I go to the Pentecostal Christianity which provides me with something, a freedom from this awful place that I've been having. Mm -hmm. you know? And there lies part of the danger that I was alluding to in the book with this particular panel. I mean, you've opened up a whole, what you seem to be talking about is that it's a form of consciousness, a high level of consciousness. And in an odd way, when I'm, I'm just free associating this, I know it's not what you guys believe in, but it's almost like selfhood. It's individuation of a certain thing. Almost like what? Selfhood. selfhood. I mean, mm -hmm. It's not a, it, it's a, it, it, it involves a, you just said it, you see yourself seeing. Can I expand no. a little bit on what you're saying? I was going to, 
There is a kind of, um, when you ask why, why, why do we stay with things, why do, what, what's this impulse, um, there is a sense that we all have a, a kind of reach toward understanding and that, that something happens, some split that has to, that, 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 re, that requires mending in order to understand. And it's referred to in various traditions in different ways. I'll just give you um, one um, is in which um, uh, this um, founder, uh, is actually the grandson of the founder of Hasidism, so not, not the Baal Shem Tov, but Nachman of Bratzlov, um, about whom I wrote. Oh, who is it? Who is it? Nachman of Bratzlov. I wrote about him um, in a bit in uh, my last novel, The Seventh Beggar. Um, he talks, there's a story, um, and you probably can find similar stories in Kafka, um, about the heart and the spring. Have you heard that? Yeah. In which the heart and the spring face each other at a distance, and they both are, crave each other and need each other to be able to stay alive. But as soon as the heart approaches the spring, they both disintegrate. It, and so they have to they, they have to stay apart in order to survive. Mm. Um, and there's only a limited amount of time in which the heart can live. And every time the last minute at the last minute, he somehow um, gets an award of another bit of slot of time, so he can continue living. So they're always on this edge. Um, but this uh, idea of this need to come together is referred to as a kind of um, a unity that's between the I and the thou. And the I and the thou, the Martin Buber, is really, it's all an internal sort of unity. It's all, you know, you can call it the alter ego, I guess, in some, and, um, where in which they, um, the two need to come together. Um, there's a sense that they need to be together. Um, and um, that's the pull, that, that's, and according to these mystics, the pull that the human feels toward the wisdom of trying to understand through the suffering. Um, so well, that so they, they get to the other side of it and, you know, and on some level. Maybe human beings have strong defenses against coming together. It's like, it's almost as if coming together can be suffocating. We break it apart. We, uh, I want to be free. I don't want to be too together. And but they had your huge coll collectivities of people. Oh, and, but then I want to be together. Fundamentalism. Right, when I'm all alone so and isolated, it goes back and forth. Yeah. It goes back and forth. Like, and, and what's trying, one of the things I think that one's trying to, I don't know what to call it, uh, uh, modulate is uh, an incapacity and, and not knowing what to do with disturbance. And I remember uh, in the letter that was discovered with the Mohammed Atta, uh, the yeah. suicide bomber, one of the promises that the uh, teacher made to him if he does this is he'll be disturbance free. He won't have the same, the, the, his disturbances will be gone. He's right. No. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's not, and it's, and it's, it's not clear what we, how do we handle disturbance? What do we do with it? And all kinds of disturbances. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that our our, our equipment has more evolution to to undergo. That's why I love your singing, the Winnicott story. Ah. It's a wonderful story. It's a little bit more full of eighty seven. So the great biblical story of um, Jacob fighting with the angel, yeah. um, uh, according to Sufi interpretation, is that the angel, in order, to, in order to become fully himself, to become the nation of Israel, and his name changes after that struggle, he actually is fighting himself. The yes. angel is a shadow of himself. There's a phase of struggle that one can't uh, bypass, right. really. Well, again, we're talking about, you're going back to your question of how do we stay with something? Why do we stay with something? What was the, the Buddha's capacity to stay with his suffering? Uh, what is uh, the difference between someone who stays with the anger and someone who throws yeah. the ashtray? And uh, I don't know, I'm thinking of... Uh, Tibetan teacher that I know of who talks a lot about reactivity and uh, the speed with which the mind reacts and grabs to an object is where is the different is is the difference that I think you're aiming for there. Uh, you could say that uh, meditate a, a, a serious spiritual practice is a way of slowing down the speed of reactivity. Yeah. 
And in that sense, I think you could probably look to some neuroscience to see some effect of the, maybe there is some neurological correlate. I don't, I don't think that would be necessarily important, but the practice, the, all the practices are, uh, in, are about slowing down the speed of the reactivity. And we all know from our own lives, I think, that the, the worse off we are, the faster we react. And uh, the, uh, again, these guys who are in prison are people who uh, who are probably who have very fast reactive minds. You know that. Because. Yeah. Let me tell you a story, a prison story. Uh, I read it a long, long time ago uh, in a psychology uh, journal. And it was a psychologist uh, who worked in prisons. And one of the things he said he did was uh, teach. He, he was working with this one particular one particular killer, and uh, who was not going to undergo a transformation process, but what he got him engaged in was, let's build a sewer system together. And they went on for like a half a year, they were trying to build the sewer system, but then all these things would happen, these disruptions would come, it would break down like the oil spill, you know, and the, the, the pipes couldn't contain, and it, it was a sewer system for anger, uh, for that reactivity. And it's like he, it's like the therapist presented it. Well, you know, you don't have any, you don't have a psychic toilet, you don't have a psychic sewer system, and he engaged the guy to actually, and to, to, in a concrete way, build a psychic sewer system, which took him two years to build, but which made an enormous difference to the man's life. Uh, it, it had to break down and break down and break down and break down. But they actually got a, a better, a better sewer. They got something of a sewer system that he never had. Uh, Some place that these feelings that are going to cause no good can somehow travel, have the freedom to go somewhere. Sounds like the labyrinth of the Minotaur. <laughs> well, the, what happens in the sewer? The stuff empties out into the into the great waters. Eventually. Just don't swim in the water. Don't swim in the water. <laughs> we're awesome. We're always swimming in the water. That's what we're, we're not going to, we're always swimming in our own shit. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, there was a, a, published a few years ago, a study that was done of American film, of Hollywood films, uh, of a, some 25 year period. I'm not sure when the study came out, but a study, the frequency of dialogues, the frequency of lines that, that occurred. And the, the line uh, that occurred more than any other in American films, let's get out of here. Oh. <laughs> uh, and you're speaking of reactivity. You're, uh, you're speaking of, uh, I always thought it was a wonderful explanation for suicide bombers, but, uh, or maybe the ultimate explanation for it, like you said about Muhammad Atta, that he could be at peace that you yes. could get out of here. That's finally. one of them. It, it combines an amazing, it combines at least two or three things in a full way, in a very satisfying way. Self-surrender, to gratify one's sense of surrender, and this, and this Why? Absolute, Why? Uh, because he's surrendering to a higher power. He's doing God's oh, work. Muhammad. He's doing, uh, he's doing Allah's work. He also gets the virgins. The virgins. You get the virgins, but that's secondary. For some people it might be primary. But, but this feeling of total self-giving, along, uh, along with the sense of the gratification of, uh, uh, of total aggression, of total destructiveness. I don't know if you know um, uh, some of the background of Muhammad Atta. I did some research, having written uh, American Taliban. Um, he actually was a student um, of um, urban architecture, studying in Germany. And the thing that really disturbed him was seeing how um, progress um, and modernity destroyed commu older communities, especially mo Muslim communities, and how the arch urban arch the architecture changed everything. They fragmented um, uh, these particular communities that had formed in a place where it was unlikely for them to be living in the first place. Um, he wasn't actually a very religious man. He'd gone on to secondary education, you know, higher education. And the disturbance, he wrote a, his thesis, his, um, his dissertation was on this, on this topic. Um, and so this disturbance, this 
feeling that he couldn't change the world, he couldn't make a difference, um, sent him into um, Islam, really deeper into Islam, and he decided to make um, his pilgrimage. And the pilgrimage itself, seeing so many people together, coming together to this, moved him so much, and that's what convinced him that he wanted to do something important enough, once and for all, kind of thing. Um, yes, submission to something, a, a feeling that he's actually getting something done in a place where he felt very helpless. I would say even more than submission, a, a surrender, a surrender to uh, something greater, and uh, uh, combined with uh, having an out, uh, uh, gratification for one's total destructive feelings. The surrender and destruction, quite a combination. Richard, did you, I was curious, you made a very interesting point about slowing things down, that you actually sort of were going and you're looking in a direction. Did you have any uh, kind of response to that notion that in, in these religious systems that there is a kind of slow down the impulse, uh, you know, uh, it's an impulse control problem that human beings uh, well, my, the only response I have is that that strikes me as counter to evolutionary pressures. That rather than slow down responses to environmental events, if you're going to survive, you'd better do it fast. So, but are you talking about a, a, an evolutionary <laughs> response in a, um, I mean, in a, in a sort of a natural world, or I mean, aren't many of the pressures that we're dealing with that uh, speed us up are not, don't require, you know, our life is not in danger. We're not reacting to being attacked by an animal or, you know, running to escape, but we're well, just. Well, we have that evolutionary heritage, though. Of course. Well, we're trying course. to escape from our mate or something, or a partner, or. We over, overreact to our partner. Kind well, of, nobody uh, ever was said evolution. Was no, perfect. I think you're thinking about like my students. I think are evolving. Um, they are much better at multitasking. Something's got to be changing. They can do 20 things at once. Um, and that, that's progress. Well, yes. it's a it's evolution. I'm not saying that it's in a good a good place. Like yeah. for me as a writer, the one thing I had to learn, and I had this up in in my mind always, was patience. You know, I, I wanted to slow down my reactions. When I know I know that I can be fast, I'll go and catch a glass and cut myself on the way. Mm. And I want to stop. That's what mm -hmm. you did. I did that and cut two tendons. I want to stop that sort of thing. Yes, as because for attentiveness, for um, for following a character or just doing any creative enterprise, you want a kind of slower mind. Well, what, so, what you're bringing up, really? Yeah. One of the reasons I think my students can't um, sustain, have a greater sustained, um, uh, like more um, attentiveness for a longer span of time is because they're used to everything happening so quickly. This is, there's a kind of training involved in you know, uh, iPods and texting well, and all maybe of that. You're talking about an adaptive speed, and she's talking about a less adaptive, a more, I don't know what, not maladaptive, because it's the current Time, you know, it's like a, if a if a skunk or a deer is, or an animal that lives in the woods is now living in the city, uh, the chances are they're going to be roadkill at some point, and they wouldn't have become roadkill if they had their own environment. So it's like this adaptive thing that they you're talking. Be, they wouldn't have become roadkill if they got out of the way of the car fast enough. But they didn't know what the hell the world was. They had now a their map of, of the world wasn't working in their new environment. Their, their mapping system hadn't caught up with the new reality. They were sort of behind the times of their own life. And uh, what you're talking about is a quick re ad reactivity that's necessary in certain situations for, for survival, but in other situations it's counterproductive. Because uh, uh, you know a, a very fast reactivity in a love relationship may or may not be productive. Yeah, may or may not. Yeah. Right. Who can disagree with that? It may or may not. Well, yeah, but it, it's uh, that's part of that's part of the, that's part of our uh, that anything we do can have multiple possible multiple meanings. It can work one way in one context and be 
uh, destructive in another context. But uh, you, I, I'm, I'm curious, you've written uh, or, uh, and given a lot of thought to the question of health and uh, health and uh, the relation of, of notions of health and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and science as if, you know, uh, the idea that spirituality is healthier it, it can, can lead to healthier and that there are scientific ways of investigating it. And I am, I'm, I'd be curious if you, uh, if you could share, be, share that with the people here because I think it's uh, important research. Well, there are claims made that religious devotion is good for your health or that spirituality is good for your health, but the, the claims are based on extremely poorly conducted research and the evidence is really just completely lacking to support such claims. The, uh, it, it's, the evidence is terrible in the case of denominational religions where at least you know what you're talking about. I mean, you know what Judaism or Catholicism or Protestantism is. Uh, when you get to spirituality, it's, I mean, you, nobody can even figure out what it means. And so if you can't figure out what it means, then you can't study it. Then if you can't study it, then you can't make claims about its health benefits. I mean, I, there was a, there was a, you know, there was a cover story at Newsweek about four years ago or so on spirituality in America. And I, I recall that there were a number of articles associated with the cover story. And in one of the articles, a young, uh, an Oregon woman was quoted as saying she practices her spirituality by five mile runs and composting. Well, okay, good. Because <laughs> if that's spirituality, then anything is spirituality. And so, you know, what, what can you say about it? You can't. And this is a good point, which we, uh, like this is what we usually have the people can be uh, If you'd like to come up, come to a mic. You have to come up to the mic. Yep. And we record you. Just come right now because we, oh. we had the cat, because other people are downstairs listening. It's too late in the evening to get to the topic that was described in the description. <laughs> Namely, this roundtable will examine the, the factors that draw people into fundamentalist religious sects while addressing the psychological transformations that occur through belonging to a group. Oh, did nobody hear? Shall I say it again? Okay. I wonder if it's too late to spend a few minutes talking about the topic that was described in the invitation. Namely, this roundtable will examine the factors that draw people into fundamental religious sects while addressing the psychological uh, transformations that occur through belonging to a group and attaining the states of mind rendered by highly invasive religions. That's a, the main point being, what are the factors that draw people into fundamental religious sects? And I haven't heard anything about that tonight. Like to I think we did address it, actually, it, inadvertently and advertently at different moments. But it, would anyone like to um, respond to I think we have addressed it in spite of ourselves. Uh, uh, but uh, I would say we, we're, we're addressing one theme is uh, get it, uh, escape from the self. Uh, to go beyond the self uh, is uh, what, draw, what draws, I think you could hear in the story about Muhammad Atta, what drew him in was the, uh, the yearning to escape the limitations and the suffering of the self. But again, uh, the difference between fundamentalism and the religious inspiration, you could say, is the reification, is form. And that form is, becomes a, um, not just a, um, a contradiction of the original vision, but a complete violent betrayal of it. So I think we've been talking about that all night. I would say that the, the um, impulse toward fundamentalism is actually a way to <coughs> avoid the difficulty of knowing the self rather than calling it the limitations, I would say that the self is deep and difficult to know and entering into a more communal world that provides certainties and structures is soothing to many, especially those who haven't had it yeah. and who feel at a loss in the modern world. Um, do they actually, I mean, what, what do they actually find there? Um, do they get what they're looking for? I would, I would argue that no, but that's me. Um, 
Yeah, so but you you for earlier certainty. Question of certainty. Excuse me? Certainty. Yeah. yeah. Would, that, that underlies it. That, that would be tantamount, in my view, to the question about the addressing that particular way of saying it fundamentally. Well, there'd probably also be a different levels uh, it would be like personal personal reason personal levels one's own makeup there'd be social social injustice levels injustice levels possibly uh, feeling wrong like uh, what Pearl talked about uh, Mohammed Atta feeling that uh, the modern age was destroying uh, something uh, old and valuable and uh, spiritual levels. You have social, social, political, economic, level, uh, personal, social, political, economic, and and spiritual levels. And I was, I was thinking, uh, and and I think one underlying factor that I've, I've kept emphasizing is not simply reification, not simply control, not simply uncertainty. But uh, an, an unconscious pressure, an unconscious sense that we don't know what to do with ourselves, that we don't know what to do with our makeup, that we don't know what to do with the emotional pressures that egg us on, that pressure us, and that we're ev our, ev our evolution as psychical beings, as psycho spiritual, psycho spiritual social beings, is lagging behind the kinds of pressures that are pushing us. And uh, we, it's going to, can the kinds of pressures that are pushing us stimulate further development, or will we screw it up? In all the myths, you start off with something happy. You know, God created the earth and it's good. In the Garden of Eden, you know, hunky-dory. And then something bad happens. Uh, it's like Laurel and Hardy, you know. What, what, Laurel and Hardy. One says, oh, Hardy, it's such a beautiful day. And you know, that's a signal for, you know. <laughs> or, when, or when Jacob says, you know, when Jacob, he just has, settles his dispute with Esau, and they go their own ways, they agree to just go their own ways. And then he settles in a new land with, with other peoples. And he says, ah, now maybe we could have a period of peace. And of course, all hell broke out. So we, I think we have this, this, this link somehow that, you know, like on last Friday I was feeling particularly good. I don't know why I woke up feeling good. I felt even happy. <laughs> and I meditated and everything was, the day was going well. And then uh, I was not, uh, and then I, I started slicing an apple. <laughs> Uh, how does he, well, I wasn't able to integrate the tension between this good feeling that had happened that was continuing and time and space where you have to watch out what you're doing with the knife. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic point here. Right? I think there's something very, very fragile about this whole proposition here. And, and, and that the, like the Unibomber. You know, yeah, the yeah. Unibomber. Yeah, I mean, and, and Muhammad, what you said about Muhammad Atta, I mean, is, all that is very close to some rather beautiful things. It's yes. just, per, they're perversions. Yeah. Well, what do you mean perversions? Well, they're perversions of impulse. I mean, the, 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 and what you said about Muhammad Atta, I don't really know what I mean. I don't know whether it's... <laughs> I don't, I don't, what did he say? It may be a perversion. It may be that we're, we're just inherently perverse beings, but it's also lack of capacity. An incapacity to deal with these. Uh, Another question. Um, turn, turn. Who are you, by the way? We'd like to know. Okay, my name is Madeline Greenberg, and um, I'm a mystic, okay? And I've experienced Christian mysticism. I believe in ecstasy and all for it. Great. That's my personal experience. I'm also a psychotherapist. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Good combination. <laughs> so what I'm wondering is, um, returning to the topic that was advertised that somebody else suggested, <laughs> if um, a couple of things. One, has anybody here experienced ecstasy? That's part one of the question. Two, are you comfortable with it? Can you sustain it? And three, can you integrate the, the, the fundamental state of ecstasy, which I'm saying just is for some, some people some of the time, with um, 
with the fundamentals of being a religious person. So let me explain that a little bit. Let's say that uh, ecstasy is, religion is, and that there can be a fundamentalism of religion, which is not, let's say, uh, having to follow a whole lot of very controlling laws, but just the basis of religion is ecstasy. So can you talk about that? Anybody want to pipe in with something like that? And I'll sit down. Who says the basis of religion is ecstasy? Religion does. Oh, yeah? Yeah. John Calvin didn't think so. <laughs> Um, a lot of his writing didn't, but I think there were parts that did. I think that the basis of, you, you know, there's going to be a mixture of emotional states in, in any text, but um, the striving was always a union with God. And the laws of, this is by how I see it at any rate, and you may not, you obviously don't, um, a way to help other people get closer to that union with God. And I think that this lady who's interested in Sufism might have something to say about that. Well, first, first of all, the, what religion calls ecstasy um, might differ from what spiritualists or mystics call ecstasy. So the union with God, a mystic might say, well, it depends on who you, what you define, how you define God. Um, you know, so, so, so we're back at the problem of definitions, really, and that always becomes a problem. Um, in any conversations. Um, so what was your question, whether we experienced ecstasy? Yeah. <laughs> I once asked Har Harold Bloom that question. <laughs> I asked Harold Bloom that question. Yeah. It's a very rude question. <laughs> I know it's rude. I understand. Um, and um, uh, he actually evaded the answer, but I've, um, in a book that uh, he wrote a preface for, uh, to a book I, I reread and really love by Corbin. Henry Corbin, Alone with the Alone. And in the preface, he says that he himself has only descended that deep into such, to those depths a very few times in his life and for a very short period of time. And the problem with um, asking the question is that for anyone who has had that kind of descent, I think they're never sure they actually got there entirely. What do you mean descent? Yeah. Descent. He talks, he talks, I know you would think of it as an ascent. Yeah. He talks, I mentioned it before, I mean, he talks about the goal of ecstasy, you know, what we call this experience of ecstasy, if you take the mystic's version of it and we leave God out of it, because I don't know what God is, who God is. Um, uh, the goal is a self-knowledge, self-knowing. The, the idea is to know and be known at the same time. And he calls it a knowledge, an intimacy with the deepest, oldest, and best self within you. So, of course, the question always remains, did you actually get to that if, you, if you've had that descent? You know, I, I want to talk a little bit about the whole... Um, I really see this experience of, of what that we're calling ecstasy, um, the ecstatic experience of uh, um, an individual's experience that is really, in a way, almost too deep and uh, difficult to talk about. But we have, in American transcendentalism, um, and in our foundational ideas of who we are and what the making of an American is, um, these are all at, in, within what, what we might call the American religion. What, what Harold Bloom actually has called the American religion. Um, Whitman talks about, in, in a song, uh, when he celebrates himself, song itself, um, going out naked in the woods. What does he actually mean by that? He, want, that? he wants to get away from all the perfumes in the room. I'm not quoting the lines precisely. But the perfumes in the rooms are other people. Their fragrance, their very being influences Will, will bear influence on him, which means he will not know his true self. And so going out naked in the woods is a way of like getting away from all the influences and being alone. And solitude is really one of the highest forms of being, um, to, because it is the, the experience of ecstasy um, going into the self is, even if you're in, with many people praying the way, you know, with rounded back and with uh, in in a mosque with thousands of other worshippers, it's a, a the notion is to be with yourself, only with yourself, and to for those moments to know that to know that self. Um, I, 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 
can, one more. Uh, the, my teacher, again, that I, I always returning to, uh, uh, one day I asked him how he, how he was doing. He said, well, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, so I said, come on, you always say that. How are you really? You're, you're, nobody is okay every day. You say that every time I ask you. He says, when I'm okay, I'm fine, and when I'm not okay, I'm fine. <laughs> to me, that's a definition of ecstasy. The other p pursuit of ecstasy is just a pursuit of high sensation. I think it's very dangerous, and uh, uh, I think, frankly, why not do heroin if you really want that? Uh, no, I, I, uh, I, I would argue that that's not the high sensation is not what ecstasy is. I'm not talking well, about I, the that, drug. No, I would generally what it's called uh, when we're talking about the pursuit of this uh, exquisite sensation like that. Con consciousness. <coughs> it's a, an expansion of consciousness. Well, really. I would I would su sub suggest that what he said about his freedom from his discriminating mind is his ecstasy, is an ecstatic experience. Yeah. Is He's talking about a kind of equanimity yes. that's very godly, and yes, there is yeah. um, that. If you want to say that equanimity is a synonym for ecstasy. Well, I don't like the word ecstasy either. I mean, I, I, was, I did sort of make the argument that the title bothered me. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say to the woman who asked the question, yes, I've experienced ecstasy. I am an ecstatic of sorts, also a depressive. And uh, and uh, a mystic, and also a realist, and uh, I don't find a contradiction between the different dimensions of being. What I find the difficulty is has, how do you support them? How do you support the tension between all the amazing capacities we have, and and how do you how do you work with them in a way that's not going to do too much harm? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm Barbara Kane. I think the question is partly alluded to or asked because I was really curious about the experience of ecstasy and how it gets funneled or constricted or restricted and why we seem not to handle it very well, perhaps. And uh, I was thinking about of Mike's beginning his book on ecstasy, mentioning Hannah Arendt in class, who is definitely not a mystic, alluding to having an ecstatic experience teaching. What is she talking about? And I've been studying, reading the various translations of the Song of Songs, definitely a poem of ecstasy, a secular poem actually, in uh, translation, and not alone at all. Union. And very speedy. Come with me, make haste. There's an, a, uh, material aliveness. So I was wondering what you're alluding to in the what your experiences of ecstasy are and and why it seems so explosive often. Well, that's the real question. Is mm -hmm. there there is a link, I, I think, between ecstasy and destructiveness, as well as ecstasy and creativeness, and uh, we don't know much about it except it really. It really does happen. It's, it's real. Make a notation. This is real. It's dangerous stuff. Handle it with care. And uh, we've talked about it getting channeled off into these destruct in, in groups that hate each other. It's like the, the hate is organized by someone else is the bad guy. I'm the good guy. You're the bad guy. And, uh, and um, I think ecstasy, on the one hand, can be life transforming in the most positive way imaginable. But it's dangerous stuff. It's like psychosis and creativity. Yes. If you, if you, if you go into the primary process, like if you go, if you sort of descend again into certain, as certain people lose the boundaries. If they lose, they, they cannot contain it, and then other people turn that into something they sublimate. They and even more, it, uh, our so called id or primary process can be more or less warped. It can be working be our primary process can be working better in the service of trying to digest feelings, or it could be skewed and warped. And unable to digest feelings, and we live in a state of chronic emotional indigestion, and very irritable. May I quickly respond to the Song of Songs reference and the togetherness, yeah. the love? Um, it's a, a parable um, about, and love is often used as a way to describe that unity. Ecstasy is often about this feeling of, of uh, unifying two shattered, you know, separated beings. As I said, the heart and the spring. 
I and thou, um, bringing it together. In Kabbalah, it's the shattered vessel, and all the parts have to be brought together. So um, people who try to experience that unity, I mean, there, there are, you, you can find um, aspects, aspects of the experience. Surfers, for example, talk about feeling at one with the wave, yeah. with the ocean, riding a horse, feeling at one with nature, feeling the hugeness of the universe and being in it. There are all kinds of descriptions of it, and in, in our literature, like the Song of Songs, love is often, and also in Sufi poetry, love is used as a kind of symbol of that unity. But don't forget that the unity that we're really talking about is a one, a final one, not two human beings so much. That's just a representation. This one is in all the major religions that I know about. It's in Taoism. Uh, Taoism has references in the, the Tao Te Ching to one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly in Buddhism also, uh, the one mind. And uh, it's in the deist religions, the one God. I'm, not, I, I'm sure there's differences between them, differences in emphasis, differences of foreground and background. But they're, so, they're all talking about something that is hitting home. We have another question. Go ahead. Our patient. Um, yeah, okay. Um, you wanted to know what I do, right? Well, I don't, you're just, just Okay, so I'm, I'm Gilles, I'm a, I'm a trained neuroscientist. And um, first I wanted to say this was like a really, really exciting, neuroscientist. sorry? Neuroscientist. neuroscientist. And that was a very exciting uh, discussion, I have to say. And uh, I, I'm going to bring my, my question of some, something I would like uh, you to comment on, if you, if you have anything. Um, I, I wanted to say that we, we got, I'm sorry, I'm looking down because this is really low. OK, that's better. Um, we got to define uh, religion and spirituality. I mean, someone got to do the job. Because obviously, we are dealing with like two different dynamics. I mean, actually, fundamentally opposed dynamics. Religion is very much about knowing what the universe is about. It seems to me that religion is about relating to the universe, giving a substance to that relationship, which is usually like a f in the form of, of a mythology, right? So you, you, you have an identity, something you can relate to. Uh, the spiritual path of mysticism is just the opposite. It's experiencing the divine. And then you confront, you face, you face directly the divine, the emptiness, the void. It's a very dissolving, uh, 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 disintegrating force. Uh, so somehow, I think historically, if we want to understand what happened, we're going to have to, to, to use those words differently, or at least use something, uh, if we don't want to do that. And, and that brings me to the fact that Historically, uh, spirit, uh, religion and spirituality, the relationship between religion and spirituality, if anything, has been a relationship of mistrust. Uh, and actually, it's interesting, Pearl, because actually what you, what you said, which uh, uh, I think is uh, at, at some point, and I really liked a lot of what you said, but I think uh, when you said at the beginning that religion start uh, with a prophet, uh, or with a spiritual experience. Historically speaking, it happens that actually that's not true. Those prophets, most of the t probably all the time, uh, but we know that for sure for Judaism and Christianity and probably for Islam, are actually invented retrospectively. We know that Jesus Christ is absolutely not the one. We are talking about the real historical uh, Jesus that existed. It has nothing to do with the one we, we believe in. Moses did, didn't exist. So, I mean, Abraham didn't exist. Those are really uh, mythological inv invention a posteriori. But it's interesting that religion always wanted to maintain and channel and was very cautious about keeping this uh, spiritual thing uh, uh, in control somehow. Even Buddhism, uh, which actually I don't think is that ambiguous uh, in a way that if you go the thing with Buddhism is that all we have from Buddhism here are monks, right? So those are people that talk about spirituality. If you go to Asia, I mean, I've been to Thailand, and I can tell you, I mean, there is really no difference between a temple in Bangkok and a, and a Catholic church in, in, in south of Italy. I mean, just people are on their knees, and they just do pretty much the same thing. It's, uh, in, in, in Asia, it's, it is a religion. I mean, there is no doubt. He's got the mind. Okay, I got the mind. <laughs> and, I, and I'm almost, I'm almost, that, that, that's the thing I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to, where I'm, I'm, my point is, uh, 
in what becomes interesting indeed, if we start to differentiate spirituality from religion, is that indeed spirituality has a very uh, interesting aspect. Like science, it is the only spirit, uh, the only human activity that face the unknown, face not knowing, right? And and so that's interesting. So I think that. As a neuroscientist, well, as a scientist, um, the idea of having uh, 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 spiritual sciences uh, develop, I think that's in very interesting. And I think we should give it a chance. Even if we just don't know what they will find out. Well, we've and had, even if the, the, the. We've had occultism, if that's what you're thinking of. A what? We've had some of that in our history. What? Occultism, uh, Madame Blavatsky, things like that. No, I'm talking, I'm talking about a science that really studies like, spiritual like a modern science. events. Right. Exactly, right? Okay. Exactly. I mean, I think what you, what you call that. And um, so, first, I think we should give it a chance. Whereas, as scientists, we should. That's just like a duty. Uh, and indeed, we should ask them to be very careful with, with their language. Because the problem, which I, I think, and I really related with you, what's really infuriating is just the way they talk about those things. It's just like, you, you cannot be in two worlds, right? You cannot be in the world of poetry and the world of science. You, you've got to choose. you got to choose your, your language. Um, I, I could say that, but I'd rather rather have my question. But that's a very good point, though. That's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> my question is this. <laughs> it's a question. It's for you some, if you know something about this. It seems to me uh, that if, uh, for, for spirituality, uh, there are two things that are interesting from a neuroscientific point of, point of view. First thing is, and also, is, um, it seems to me that everybody who has hang out with monks has noticed something really particular about those people. Rose. And usually, what? <laughs> no. No, because actually, it's true, it's true, that there's like a lot of robes. But uh, there is something really special, I think, about their uh, psychological development. And it seems that they are theories, but I don't know the data, that seems to show that people that have spiritual practice do uh, uh, accelerate their, their, their psychological uh, development overall. Uh, I, I have never seen the data. I don't know if you have seen them. I don't know if anybody has seen them. And I don't know if anybody would like to uh, comment on this. My second qu uh, uh, parallel thing to, to this is that as a neuro neuroscientist, what I think is really striking, and also I have like, I think it seems that I have some empirical evidence for that, but again, it's weak. People across the world that uh, meditate, when they go into this like resting state, what seems fascinating to me is that what they report usually is that what they experience is love. And that from a neuroscientist uh, point of view and from an evolutionary point of view, that's really striking. Because love is not really nowhere in the evolution, uh, evolutionary story of, of humanity as far as we have it so far. And yet, that's really a very important point. And it, it seems that it appears that kind of really consistently in, in this type of practices. So those are the two things I, 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 I wanted to, to bring, uh, which is really the interest that we have in, in, in um, having science getting really involved in, in the world of spirituality. Sorry for the long thing. We have three minutes to answer that question. We're going to give it to Richard. <laughs> well, what part of spirituality do you want to study? The composting or the five-mile runs? <laughs> I, I don't know what you mean. I, you know, it, if you can't say what... Sci, science is a, is a discipline. It's one way of trying to understand the world. It's not the only way of trying to understand the world, but if you want to try to... If you want to follow science then you have to be clear about what you mean. And if you can't say what spirituality is, and I can't, if you can't say what it is, if you can't define it in a way that allows you to measure it and then quantify it, then you can't study it. That doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean it's not significant. It doesn't mean it's not a, a useful way of looking at the world. But you can't study it scientifically. Well, well addressing the question of uh, 
of spirituality and religion if we can do it in a very, it's a very general sense right now since we're pressed for time. But uh, in, in, uh, all, in all religion, I think, but particularly in Buddhism, we talk about form and emptiness. Form is uh, the relative world. We all live in the relative world in, inescapably, but we also have uh, live in the absolute, which is the present moment. So that's why I said, uh, why do we have to choose? You, to get involved in choosing between them is a hopeless task. And uh, the most radical thing about Buddhism, I think, is the ultimate realization that form and emptiness are the same. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Uh, but again, then you'd have to, if you want to talk about spirituality and religion, I think you have to start with those terms. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.